The Chemist's Wife, a short story by Anton Chekhov. The little town of B, consisting of two or three crooked streets, was sound asleep. There was a complete stillness in the motionless air. Nothing could be heard but far away, outside the town, no doubt, the barking of a dog in a thin, hoarse tenor. It was close upon daybreak. Everything had long been asleep. The only person not asleep was the young wife of Chernomordic, a qualified dispenser who kept a chemist's shop at B. She had gone to bed and got up again three times, but could not sleep. She did not know why. She sat at the open window in her nightdress and looked into the street. She felt bored, depressed, vexed. So vexed that she felt quite inclined to cry. Again, she did not know why. There seemed to be a lump in her chest that kept rising into her throat. A few paces behind her, Cherno Mordic lay curled up close to the wall, snoring sweetly. A greedy flea was stabbing the bridge of his nose, but he did not feel it and was positively smiling, for he was dreaming that everyone in the town had a cough and was buying from him the King of Denmark's cough drops. He could not have been wakened now by pinpricks or by cannon or by caresses. The chemist's shop was almost at the extreme end of the town, so that the chemist's wife could see far into the fields. She could see the eastern horizon growing pale by degrees, then turning crimson as though from a great fire. A big broad-faced moon peeped out unexpectedly from behind bushes in the distance. It was red. As a rule, when the moon emerges from behind bushes, it appears to be blushing. Suddenly, in the stillness of the night, there came the sounds of footsteps and a jingle of spurs. She could hear voices. That must be the officers going home to the camp from the police captains, thought the chemist's wife. Soon afterwards, two figures wearing officers' white tunics came into sight, one big and tall, the other thinner and shorter. They slouched along by the fence, dragging one leg after the other and talking loudly together. As they passed the chemist's shop, they walked more slowly than ever and glanced up at the windows. It smells like a chemist's, said the thin one, and so it is. Ah, I remember. I came here last week to buy some castor oil. There's a chemist here with a sour face and the jawbone of an ass. Such a jawbone, my dear fellow. It must have been a jawbone like that Samson killed the Philistines with. Me, yes, said the big one in a bass voice. The pharmacist is asleep, and his wife is asleep too. She is a pretty woman, Obtiosov. I saw her. I liked her very much. Tell me, doctor, can she possibly love that jawbone of an ass? Can she? No, most likely she does not love him, sighed the doctor, speaking as though he were sorry for the chemist. The little woman is asleep behind the window, Obtiosov. What? Tossing with the heat, her little mouth half open, and one little foot hanging out of bed. I bet that fool the chemist doesn't realize what a lucky fellow he is. No doubt he sees no difference between a woman and a bottle of carbolic. I say, doctor, said the officer, stopping. Let us go into the shop and buy something. Perhaps we shall see her. What an idea in the night. What of it? They are obliged to serve one even at night. My dear fellow, let us go in. If you like. The chemist's wife, hiding behind the curtain, heard a muffled ring. Looking round at her husband, who was smiling and snoring sweetly as before, she threw on her dress, slid her bare feet into her slippers, and ran to the shop. On the other side of the glass door, she could see two shadows. The chemist's wife turned up the lamp and hurried to the door to open it, and now she felt neither vexed nor bored nor inclined to cry, though her heart was thumping. The big doctor and the slender Obtiosov walked in. Now she could get a view of them. The doctor was corpulent and swarthy. He wore a beard and was slow in his movements. At the slightest motion, his tunic seemed as though it would crack, and perspiration came onto his face. The officer was rosy, clean-shaven, feminine-looking, and as supple as an English whip. What may I give you? asked the chemist's wife, holding her dress across her bosom. Give us, Errah. Four pennyworth of peppermint lozenges. Without haste, the chemist's wife took down a jar from a shelf and began weighing out lozenges. 
The customers stared fixedly at her back. The doctor screwed up his eyes like a well-fed cat, while the lieutenant was very grave. It's the first time I've seen a lady serving in a chemist's shop, observed the doctor. There's nothing out of the way in it, replied the chemist's wife, looking out of the corner of her eye at the rosy-cheeked officer. My husband has no assistant, and I always help him. To be sure, you have a charming little shop. What a number of different jars! And you are not afraid of moving about among the poisons. Burr! The chemist's wife sealed up the parcel and handed it to the doctor. Obtiosov gave her the money. Half a minute of silence followed. The men exchanged glances, took a step towards the door, then looked at one another again. Will you give me two pennyworth of soda? said the doctor. Again, the chemist's wife slowly and languidly raised her hand to the shelf. Haven't you in the shop anything? Such as, muttered Obtiosov, moving his fingers, something, so to say, allegorical, revivifying, seltzer water, for instance. Have you any seltzer water? Yes, answered the chemist's wife. Bravo, you're a fairy, not a woman. Give us three bottles. The chemist's wife hurriedly sealed up the soda and vanished through the door into the darkness. A peach, said the doctor with a wink. You wouldn't find a pineapple like that in the island of Madeira. Eh? What do you say? Do you hear the snoring, though? That's his worship, the chemist, enjoying sweet repose. A minute later, the chemist's wife came back and set five bottles on the counter. She had just been in the cellar and so was flushed and rather excited. Shh, quietly, said Obtiosov, when, after uncorking the bottles, she dropped the corkscrew. Don't make such a noise. You'll wake your husband. Well, what if I do wake him? He is sleeping so sweetly. He must be dreaming of you. To your health. Besides, boomed the doctor, hiccuping after the seltzer water, husbands are such a dull business that it would be very nice of them to be always asleep. How good a drop of red wine would be in this water. What an idea, laughed the chemist's wife. That would be splendid. What a pity they don't sell spirits in chemist's shops, though you ought to sell wine as a medicine. Have you any vinum gallicum rubrum? Yes. Well then, give us some. Bring it here, damn it. How much do you want? Quantum satis. Give us an ounce each in the water, and afterwards we'll see. Obtiosov, what do you say? first with water, and afterwards per se. The doctor and Obtiosov sat down to the counter, took off their caps, and began drinking the wine. The wine, one must admit, is wretched stuff, vinum nastissimum, though in the presence of, uh, it tastes like nectar. You are enchanting, madam. In imagination, I kiss your hand. I would give a great deal to do so, not in imagination said Obtiosov. On my honor, I'd give my life. That's enough, said Madame Chernomordic, flushing and assuming a serious expression. What a flirt you are, though, the doctor laughed softly, looking slyly at her from under his brows. Your eyes seem to be firing shot. Piff puff, I congratulate you. You've conquered. We are vanquished. The chemist's wife looked at their ruddy faces, listened to their chatter, and soon she, too, grew quite lively. Oh, she felt so gay. She entered into the conversation. She laughed, flirted, and even, after repeated requests from the customers, drank two ounces of wine. You officers ought to come in oftener from the camp, she said. It's awful how dreary it is here. I'm simply dying of it. I should think so, said the doctor indignantly. Such a peach! a miracle of nature thrown away in the wilds. How well Griboidov said, into the wilds to Saratov. It's time for us to be off, though. Delighted to have made your acquaintance. Very. How much do we owe you? The chemist's wife raised her eyes to the ceiling, and her lips moved for some time. Twelve rubles, forty-eight kopecks, she said. Obtiosov took out of his pocket a fat pocketbook, and after fumbling for some time among the notes, paid. Your husband's sleeping sweetly. He must be dreaming, he muttered, pressing her hand at parting. I don't like to hear silly remarks. 
What silly remarks. On the contrary, it's not silly at all. Even Shakespeare said, Happy is he who in his youth is young. Let go of my hand. At last, after much talk, and after kissing the lady's hand at parting, the customers went out of the shop irresolutely, as though they were wondering whether they had not forgotten something. She ran quickly into the bedroom and sat down in the same place. She saw the doctor and the officer, on coming out of the shop, walk lazily away a distance of twenty paces. Then they stopped and began whispering together. What about? Her heart throbbed, there was a pulsing in her temples, and why she did not know. Her heart beat violently, as though those two whispering outside were deciding her fate. Five minutes later, the doctor parted from Obtyosov and walked on, while Obtyosov came back. He walked past the shop once and a second time. He would stop near the door, and then take a few steps again. At last, the bell tinkled discreetly. What? Who is there? The chemist's wife heard her husband's voice suddenly. There's a ring at the bell, and you don't hear it, he said severely. Is that the way to do things? He got up, put on his dressing gown, and staggering, half asleep, flopped in his slippers to the shop. What? Is it? he asked Obtyosov. Give me, give me four pennyworth of peppermint lozenges. Sniffing continually, yawning, dropping asleep as he moved, and knocking his knees against the counter, the chemist went to the shelf and reached down the jar. Two minutes later, the chemist's wife saw Obtyosov go out of the shop, and after he had gone some steps, she saw him throw the packet of peppermints on the dusty. Road The doctor came from behind a corner to meet him. They met, and gesticulating, vanished in the morning mist. How unhappy I am, said the chemist's wife, looking angrily at her husband, who was undressing quickly to get into bed again. Oh, how unhappy I am, she repeated, suddenly melting into bitter tears. And nobody knows, nobody knows. I forgot fourpence on the counter, muttered the chemist, pulling the quilt over him. Put it away in the till, please. And at once he fell asleep again. The Old House, a short story by Anton Chekhov, a recollection told by a house owner. The old house had to be pulled down that a new one might be built in its place. I led the architect through the empty rooms, and between our business talk told him various stories. The tattered wallpapers, the dingy windows, the dark stoves, all bore the traces of recent habitation and evoked memories. On that staircase, for instance, drunken men were once carrying down a dead body when they stumbled and flew headlong downstairs together with the coffin. The living were badly bruised, while the dead man looked very serious, as though nothing had happened, and shook his head when they lifted him up from the ground and put him back in the coffin. You see those three doors in a row. In there lived young ladies who were always receiving visitors, and so were better dressed than any other lodgers and could pay their rent regularly. The door at the end of the corridor leads to the wash house, where by day they washed clothes and at night made an uproar and drank beer. And in that flat of three rooms, everything is saturated with bacteria and bacilli. It's not nice there. Many lodgers have died there, and I can positively assert that that flat was at some time cursed by someone, and that together with its human lodgers, there was always another lodger, unseen, living in it. I remember particularly the fate of one family. Picture to yourself an ordinary man, not remarkable in any way, with a wife, a mother, and four children. His name was Putohin. He was a copying clerk at a notary's and received thirty-five roubles a month. He was a sober, religious, serious man. When he brought me his rent for the flat, he always apologized for being badly dressed, apologized for being five days late, and when I gave him a receipt, he would smile good-humouredly and say, Oh yes, there's that too, I don't like those receipts. 
He lived poorly but decently. In that middle room, the grandmother used to be with the four children. There they used to cook, sleep, receive their visitors, and even dance. This was Putohin's own room. He had a table in it at which he used to work doing private jobs, copying parts for the theatre, advertisements, and so on. This room on the right was let to his lodger, Yegorich, a locksmith, a steady fellow, but given to drink. He was always too hot and so used to go about in his waistcoat and barefoot. Yegorich used to mend locks, pistols, children's bicycles, would not refuse to mend cheap clocks and make skates for a quarter rouble, but he despised that work and looked on himself as a specialist in musical instruments. Amongst the litter of steel and iron on his table, there was always to be seen a concertina with a broken key or a trumpet with its sides bent in. He paid Putahin two and a half roubles for his room. He was always at his work table and only came out to thrust some piece of iron into the stove. On the rare occasions when I went into that flat in the evening, this was always the picture I came upon. Putohin would be sitting at his little table, copying something. His mother and his wife, a thin woman with an exhausted-looking face, were sitting near the lamp, sewing. Yegorich would be making a rasping sound with his file, and the hot, still smouldering embers in the stove filled the room with heat and fumes. The heavy air smelt of cabbage soup, swaddling clothes and Yegorich. It was poor and stuffy, but the working-class faces, the children's little drawers hung up along by the stove, Yegorich's bits of iron had yet an air of peace, friendliness, content. In the corridor outside, the children raced about with well-combed heads, merry and profoundly convinced that everything was satisfactory in this world, and would be so endlessly that one had only to say one's prayers every morning and at bedtime. Now imagine in the midst of that same room, two paces from the stove, the coffin in which Putahin's wife is lying. There is no husband whose wife will live forever, but there was something special about this death. When, during the requiem service, I glanced at the husband's grave face, at his stern eyes, I thought, Oh, oh, brother. It seemed to me that he himself, his children, the grandmother and Yegorich, were already marked down by that unseen being which lived with them in that flat. I am a thoroughly superstitious man, perhaps, because I am a house owner, and for forty years have had to do with lodgers. I believe if you don't win at cards from the beginning, you will go on losing to the end. When fate wants to wipe you and your family off the face of the earth, it remains inexorable in its persecution, and the first misfortune is commonly only the first of a long series. Misfortunes are like stones. One stone has only to drop from a high cliff for others to be set rolling after it. In short, as I came away from the requiem service at Putohin's, I believed that he and his family were in a bad way. And in fact, a week afterwards the notary quite unexpectedly dismissed Putohin and engaged a young lady in his place. And would you believe it, Putohin was not so much put out at the loss of his job as at being superseded by a young lady and not by a man. Why a young lady? He so resented this that on his return home he thrashed his children, swore at his mother, and got drunk. Yegorich got drunk too to keep him company. Putohin brought me the rent, but did not apologize this time, though it was eighteen days overdue, and said nothing when he took the receipt from me. The following month the rent was brought by his mother. She only brought me half, and promised to bring the remainder a week later. The third month I did not get a farthing, and the porter complained to me that the lodgers in Nomor 23 were not behaving like gentlemen. These were ominous symptoms. Picture this scene. A sombre Petersburg morning looks in at the dingy windows. By the stove the granny is pouring out the children's tea. Only the eldest, Vasya, drinks out of a glass. For the others, the tea is poured out into saucers. Yegorich is squatting on his heels before the stove, thrusting a bit of iron into the fire. His head is heavy, and his eyes are lusterless from yesterday's drinking bout. He sighs and groans, trembles and coughs. He has quite put me off the right way, the devil, he grumbles. He drinks himself, 
and leads others into sin. Putohin sits in his room, on the bedstead from which the bedclothes and the pillows have long ago disappeared, and with his hands straying in his hair, looks blankly at the floor at his feet. He is tattered, unkempt, and ill. Drink it up, make haste, or you will be late for school, the old woman urges on Vasya, and it's time for me, too, to go and scrub the floors for the Jews. The old woman is the only one in the flat who does not lose heart. She thinks of old times and goes out to hard, dirty work. On Fridays, she scrubs the floors for the Jews at the crockery shop. On Saturdays, she goes out washing for shopkeepers. And on Sundays, she is racing about the town from morning to night, trying to find ladies who will help her. Every day she has work of some sort. She washes and scrubs and is by turns a midwife, a matchmaker or a beggar. It is true she, too, is not disinclined to drown her sorrows, but even when she has had a drop, she does not forget her duties. In Russia, there are many such tough old women, and how much of its welfare rests upon them. When he has finished his tea, Vasya packs up his books in a satchel and goes behind the stove. His greatcoat ought to be hanging there beside his granny's clothes. A minute later, he comes out from behind the stove and asks, Where is my greatcoat? The grandmother and the other children look for the greatcoat together. They waste a long time in looking for it, but the greatcoat has utterly vanished. Where is it? The grandmother and Vasya are pale and frightened. Even Yegorich is surprised. Putohin is the only one who does not move. Though he is quick to notice anything irregular or disorderly, this time he makes a pretense of hearing and seeing nothing. That is suspicious. He's sold it for drink. Yegorich declares. Putohin says nothing, so it is the truth. Vasya is overcome with horror. His greatcoat, his splendid greatcoat, made of his dead mother's cloth dress, with a splendid calico lining, gone for drink at the tavern. And with the greatcoat is gone too, of course, the blue pencil that lay in the pocket, and the notebook with nota bene in gold letters on it. There's another pencil with India rubber stuck into the notebook, and besides that, there are transfer pictures lying in it. Vasya would like to cry, but to cry is impossible. If his father, who has a headache, heard crying, he would shout, stamp with his feet, and begin fighting, and after drinking, he fights horribly. Granny would stand up for Vasya, and his father would strike Granny too. It would end in Yegorich getting mixed up in it too, clutching at his father and falling on the floor with him. The two would roll on the floor, struggling together and gasping with drunken animal fury, and Granny would cry, the children would scream, the neighbours would send for the porter. No, better not cry. Because he mustn't cry or give vent to his indignation aloud, Vasya moans, wrings his hands and moves his legs convulsively, or biting his sleeve shakes it with his teeth as a dog does a hare. His eyes are frantic, and his face is distorted with despair. Looking at him, his granny all at once takes the shawl off her head, and she too makes queer movements with her arms and legs in silence, with her eyes fixed on a point in the distance. And at that moment, I believe there is a definite certainty in the minds of the boy and the old woman that their life is ruined, that there is no hope. Putohin hears no crying, but he can see it all from his room. When, half an hour later, Vasya sets off to school, wrapped in his grandmother's shawl, he goes out with a face I will not undertake to describe, and walks after him. He longs to call the boy, to comfort him, to beg his forgiveness, to promise him on his word of honour, to call his dead mother to witness, but instead of words, sobs break from him. It is a grey, cold morning. When he reaches the town school, Vasya untwists his granny's shawl and goes into the school with nothing over his jacket for fear the boys should say he looks like a woman. And when he gets home, Putohin sobs, mutters some incoherent words, bows down to the ground before his mother and Yegorich and the locksmith's table. Then, recovering himself a little, he runs to me and begs me breathlessly, for God's sake, to find him some job. I give him hopes, of course. At last I am myself again, 
he said. It's high time indeed to come to my senses. I've made a beast of myself, and now it's over. He is delighted and thanks me, while I, who have studied these gentry thoroughly during the years I have owned the house, look at him and am tempted to say, It's too late, dear fellow. You are a dead man already. From me, Putohin runs to the town school. There he paces up and down, waiting till his boy comes out. I say, Vasya, he says joyfully, when the boy at last comes out, I have just been promised a job. Wait a bit, I will buy you a splendid fur coat. I'll send you to the high school. Do you understand? To the high school? I'll make a gentleman of you, and I won't drink any more. On my honor, I won't. And he has intense faith in the bright future. But the evening comes on. The old woman, coming back from the Jews with twenty kopecks, exhausted and aching all over, sets to work to wash the children's clothes. Vasya is sitting doing a sum. Yegorich is not working. Thanks to Putohin, he has got into the way of drinking and is feeling at the moment an overwhelming desire for drink. It's hot and stuffy in the room. Steam rises in clouds from the tub where the old woman is washing. Are we going? Yegorich asks surlily. My lodger does not answer. After his excitement, he feels insufferably dreary. He struggles with the desire to drink, with acute depression, and, and of course, depression gets the best of it. It is a familiar story. Towards night, Yegorich and Putahin go out, and in the morning, Vasya cannot find Granny's shawl. That is the drama that took place in that flat. After selling the shawl for drink, Putohin did not come home again. Where he disappeared to, I don't know. After he disappeared, the old woman first got drunk, then took to her bed. She was taken to the hospital, the younger children were fetched by relations of some sort, and Vasya went into the wash house here. In the daytime, he handed the irons, and at night, fetched the beer. When he was turned out of the wash house, he went into the service of one of the young ladies, used to run about at night on errands of some sort, and began to be spoken of as a dangerous customer. What has happened to him since I don't know? And in this room here a street musician lived for ten years. When he died, they found twenty thousand roubles in his feather bed.